a good evening, good morning to friends and colleagues around the world. Um, on behalf of the Center for Humanities Research at the University of the Western Cape and UWC Press in conjunction with Quella Books, we are delighted to host Poet Laureate and Anti-Apartheid Struggle Veteran Mtate Mongane Wali Serote and a panel of luminary speakers, um, Mandla Langa, Luli Kalinikos, and Siraj Rasul, in honor of the launch of Ntate Serote's epic poem, Sikalel U O R. Um, Heidi Grinnebohm, Director of the Center for Humanities Research, and have the delight and honor today to be joined with the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at UWC, Professor Monwabisi Khalakhala, who will welcome you and will be moderating this panel discussion conversation with Ntate Serote today. Uh, Monwabisi, if I may, <laughs> um, Monwabisi is, um, in addition to being Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, he's Chair of the Centre for Humanities Research Advisory Board and holds not one, but two PhDs. Um, his scholarship and his books cover a range of areas in the field, most particularly forensic linguistics. And he focuses on language and law, the dynamics of power and translation in police and court proceedings and questions of multilingualism and higher education. Welcome, Monwabisi, I'm handing over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleague, for that kind introduction on my behalf. To Ndadewa Ali Sirote, Budmanja Langa, Budsiraj Rasul, Sis Luli Kalinikos, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, Molueni Khimedach, Sanbonani, Tumelang, Da, Lochani, Good afternoon, perhaps good morning to some who are part of this big event across the globe. As the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, it delights me to welcome you to the launch of Wallis Rote's epic poem, Sikhalilu O'ar, which could be freely translated as paying tribute to O'ar or original Tambo. I'm sure you will fully agree with me that we could not think of a better place to host the launch of Wallace Rota's epic poem, Sikhatilo Ardan, here at UWC, precisely in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities Center for Humanities Research. UWC, a place that has shaped the history of this country in a number of ways, a place that openly defied the apartheid university policies and declared itself as an intellectual home for the democratic left and paid allegiance for the struggles of the oppressed. UWC, a place that had a very strong relationship with the movement that made Oar Tambo, a place that has a long-standing relationship with the Robben Island Museum with deliberate efforts to disrupt the legacies of apartheid. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, the unique context and ethos of the University of the Western Cape with its history, um, with its commitment to needy students and its vision as a place of quality, a place to grow continues to provide a challenging and intellectually stimulating environment. <laughs> For studies in the various fields that we offer here. With this unique history of struggles and resistance, I'm tempted to cite former President Tabombegi, who had the privilege to write a foreword for the epic poem. I quote, in making his statement, Zerote follows in the footsteps of other eminent poets throughout the years and across the globe, who have used their creative prowess to build poetic monuments to political struggles that aim to change society." Close quote. I must point out that the question of the poet's use 
of creative prowess to build poetic monuments to political struggles that aim to change society is an important one for our contemporary society. Mm. It is not only relevant for tonight's conversations, but it also speaks to the broader issues that our society is grappling with. It is my sincere hope, therefore, and trust, I must say, that this launch of Wallace Sirota's praise poem, Sikathelu O'R, will provide space and platform to enriching conversations with wider implications for the transformation of our society, as well as the ongoing struggles for justice. With these few remarks, colleagues and friends, I'd like to once again extend a very warm welcome to all of you, especially our panelists, and wishing you the best of fruitful sharing and meaningful engagement. Thank you so much, and thank you for listening. I will now hand over to my colleague, Heidi, to at least advise us in terms of the proceedings. I will be sharing with her throughout you know, the, the event. Thank you very much. Thanks, Monwa BC. Um, to our participants and uh, to our audience, um, as the conversation proceeds, please feel free to share uh, comments and questions on the Q&A function uh, on your Zoom screen, not on the chat function. So on the Q&A function, which will be monitored and we're hoping to have time, uh, enough time to, um, to engage with, with the audience as well. So before I give the virtual floor to Ntate Serote um, to read excerpts from Sikarlel Uor and uh, to speak to some of the key ideas that he has discerned in his poem, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Ntate Serote and our panelists so um, that we can proceed with the conversation. Mungani Wali Sarote was born in Sophia Town in Johannesburg in 1944. He joined the ANC as a young person and later became involved with the Black Consciousness Movement. In 1969, he was arrested and detained for nine months in solitary confinement under the Terrorism Act. His first poetry collection, collection Como was published soon after, in 1972, and for this he won the Ingrid Jonker Prize. Serote holds a fine arts degree from Columbia University in New York, but was unable to return to South Africa after completing his studies. He remained in exile, going to Botswana in 1977, where he rejoined Umkonto Wesizwe, and where he was instrumental in establishing the immensely important Medu Art Ensemble in Khabarone. In his 18 years of exile, Zerote participated at various levels in the liberation movement. He was head of the regional underground structure in Botswana, head of the Department of Arts and Culture, member of the Regional Political Military Committee in Botswana and in Britain, and cultural attaché of the ANC in Britain and Europe. From 1990, he was head of the arts and culture of the ANC in South Africa and spearheaded the organization and mobilization of cultural workers through major festivals, symposia and conferences from Botswana to Amsterdam, London and Johannesburg. <clears throat> the author of numerous poetry collections and novels, Ntate Serote's debut novel, To Every Birth Its Blood, was published in 1981 and it's become a modern classic. In 1993, he received the Norma Award for publishing in Africa. And in 2004, the Pablo Neruda Award from the Chilean government. Quela Books published Cerote's epic poem, History is the Home Address in 2004. And in 2007, he received the Order of Ikamanga in silver for excellent contribution to literature with emphasis on poetry and for putting his artistic talents at the service of democracy in South Africa. He was made Poet Laureate the following year, and I hope we will have an opportunity to hear about that later. 
He's also served as a member of the South African Parliament and was responsible for overseeing the construction of the Freedom Park Memorial in Chwane, where he has served as CEO of the founding board. As Poet Laureate, Serote has set up the virtual Mongane Wale Serote Foundation and the Poets Laureate Hub. And Ali and Michelle will post, um, uh, Ali has posted links to the National Poet Laureate Hub and the virtual Mongane Wale Serote Foundation on the chat. Please do follow those links. I would like to introduce the rest of the panel with your permission, um, so that the conversation can flow once I've given the, the floor to Ntate Serote. I'm very happy to welcome Luli Kalinikos, an artist, sorry, an historian, well, the art of history um, in writing and a writer of the trilogy of labor and social history from below Gold and Workers, Working Life and a Place in the City, and the biographer of Oliver Tambo and Nelson Mandela. Luli was a founder of the Workers' Library and Museum in Newtown and subsequently appointed to the newly formed Department of Arts, Culture, Science and Technologies ACTAG task team in 1994 to review heritage and collective memory in a democratic South Africa. And since then, she's been a member of a number of heritage councils and boards. One of her main tasks in the Department of Arts and Culture since 1995 has been to, to participate in transforming the heritage landscape. And she served on a number of heritage boards, including the founding board of Freedom Park, where Serote served, in Luli's words, with distinction as an innovative and inspiring CEO. Luli has served on ministerial education task teams, such as the History Teaching Advisory Council for the Minister of Education, Kader Asmal, in the 1990s, and is currently a member of the Department of Basic Education's task team to introduce a decolonized history syllabus to grades 7 to 12, which is due to be presented to the Minister of Education in 2022. Luli also sits on the board of the National Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences, as well as the Council of Advisors for the Mapungubwe Institute for, of Strategic Reflection. Welcome, Luli. Siraj Rasul is Senior Professor of History at the University of the Western Cape, where he also teaches Museum and Heritage Studies and Curatorship. Among his latest publications are, and this is a selection, The Politics of Heritage in Africa, Economies, Histories and Infrastructures, co-edited with Derek Peterson and Kodzo Gavua, Rethinking Empire in Southern Africa, co-edited with Dag Henriksen, Giorgio Misha and Lorena Rizzo, Unsettled History, Making South African Public Pasts, written with Leslie Witz and Gary Minkley, and Missing and Missed, Subject Politics Memorialization, co-edited with Nikki Rousseau and Ridwan Musaji. Siraj has served on the boards of the District 6 Museum and Eco Museums of South Africa, as well as on the Human Remains Advisory Committee of the Minister of Arts and Culture. He has previously chaired the Scientific Committee of the International Council of African Museums and is member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Study of the Physical Anthropology Collection Felix von Luschan at the Staatliche Museen zu Berlin in Germany. Siraj is principal investigator on this major supranational research project, Remaking Societies, Remaking Persons, and the co-principal investigator of Action for Restitution to Africa. Welcome, Siraj. And finally, but certainly not least, uh, Mandla Langa. Mandla, welcome. Mandla hails from Durban. He went into exile in 1976 and has lived in Botswana, Mozambique, Angola, Hungary, Zambia, and Britain. 
in 1980, Mandla won Drum Magazine's Africa-wide story contest, and in 1991 was awarded the Arts Council of Great Britain bursary for creative writing. Mandla was the cultural representative of the ANC in Britain and Western Europe. He has been a columnist for various newspapers and was convener of the Task Group on Government Communications, COMTASK, in 1997, which restructured apartheid's communication systems. From 1999 to 2005, he chaired ICASA, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, and received the National Order of Ikamanga in silver for his literary and journalistic contribution to democracy. From 1999 to 2000, Mandler wrote the book of the musical Milestones, which featured music by the late and great Hugh Masakela. Pub his published works include Tenderness of Blood, A Rainbow on a Paper Sky, The Naked Song, and Other Stories. The Memory of Stones, The Lost Colors of the Chameleon, which won the 2009 Commonwealth Prize for Best Book in the African Region, and The Texture of Shadows. He co-authored Day Not Linger with Nelson Mandela Archives and has been a fellow at the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies. A recipient of honorary doctorates from Universities of Forte and Witz respectively, Mandla has an MA in creative writing from Witz. He sits on various boards such as Multi-Choices Putuma Nati and Prime Media and is a trustee of Media Monitoring Africa. He's married to June Josephs and they have four children. Thank you for including a personal touch to your biography, Mandla. Luli Sirajan Mandla will engage with Ntati Sirote on his epic poem, Sikahlel Uor, published by Quella Books. For audience who have not yet read the poem, very briefly, the poem calls up the figure of O.R. Tambo in a direct address that moves meditatively across multiple geographies and temporalities to reflect on Tambo's childhood surrounded by the Ngele Mountains in the Eastern Cape, on Tambo's life as an intellectual and as a leader of the ANC, particularly during the difficult decades of exile. The poem invokes O.R.'s ideas of study and learning, of freedom, and of the pursuit of peace with justice. In an incantational rhythm, the poem recalls the many freedom fighters who were killed or who died here, some and many alone, elsewhere on the continent, and in the spirit of a true and authentic internationalism, it recalls those freedom fighters across the world who sought to make the remake an equitable world. The poem reminds of the genocide of indigenous people in Southern Africa, as well as the politics of conviviality that once shaped the lands where Tambo was born. Affirming the interconnection of humans with other forms of life, animate and inanimate, the epic returns again and again to the contemporary moment. And through the recurring motif of touch and of fingertips, it recalls the ability of people to shape and change the world for the common good. It addresses directly OR to meditate on extraction, exploitation, dispossession and disappointment in the past and present. And to the current dearth of ideas with which these may be undone. And finally, the narrator ends with in the interrogative mode, a question that perhaps can be addressed in our conversation today. O.R., what would you say to us at this hour of history? And what would you do? I invite you and Tati Serote to take the virtual floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Greetings to my hosts, to the panelists, to the moderator, and to the virtual attendees. Before I begin, I would like to place on record my gratitude 
to my hosts, the UWC Press and the Center for Humanities, my publishers at uh, Quella Books, my hosts and sister Zubeda Jaffa, my brother Nirod Remjo and his team at African Sun Media for their hospitality. I also thank all the other people who are in different parts of the world uh, who are here. Let me share a very brief experience, uh, which I hope will contextualize a lot of things that I'm going to, to refer to in the poem. On the 16th of December, 2007, the chief of uh, operations of MK and myself arrived at what was then called the University of the North. As we entered the gate, we saw at the gate a young newspaper vendor. What was most visible about him was what was written on his t-shirt as if screaming the letters on the t-shirt said 100% Zulu. So we stopped the car, myself and General Moloi. We asked this young man, where did you get this t-shirt from? He pointed in, at the direction of the conference and said from the ANC. Uh, and of course, in our hearts of hearts, both myself and the general said it, it can't be, but we didn't say that. We checked with each other later and we found that we had thought that. I did not know that at that time, that's when I began to think This organization that we represent, what would it say about this 100% Sulu? Also, what would OR say? This became my preoccupation. Not long after that, we saw 100% vendor. These were indications that something had gone very, very, very wrong in our country, extremely wrong. But of course, uh, the conference itself did not only emphasize, it articulated the wrongness of everything, the manner it was conducted, the behavior of the, of the attendees and so on and so on. Least did we know that today in South Africa, we will know that that was the beginning of what is now called the capture of the state, the capture of the African National Congress, the capture of the country, the distancing of the people's liberation movement from the people, the depth of corruption and the actual destruction of the state, of the ANC, of the country. I began to think, what is it that, what? What does one do as an individual first when things like, like that happen? I then decided, and I don't know when it was when I decided that, but I decided, let me talk to Omar. 
because I sought guidance now. What, what does a member of the ANC, a cadre of the ANC, cadre of the people's movement do when daily, on a daily basis, what the people of this country sacrificed for was being destroyed. So I speak to OR uh, as a leader, but one very outstanding thing about OR is that if you had an encounter with him, you left knowing something about his humaneness, uh, which you'd never miss. All of these things that I've said are what informs Sikathela OOR. As the moderator said, I'll do some a reading of some of the extracts and I'll leave it at that. How do we come eyeball to eyeball with you, O.R. Us, this generation, with you, you who taught us. A hundred years of a focused and educated fight for freedom, for it to be for the ever the heartbeat of the movement, calling, whispering, seeking ways and means for all to know that batu, motu, kimutu kabatu. Ah, O.R. This credo which molded future fighters skilled to walk the world's highways, ask, ask Masisulu, for she was the young, middle-aged mother, freedom fighter, stalwart, exits at elder age. You did, Masisulu, in your silent looking, observing with a keen eye, you groomed, you groomed young women, you together with the female stalwarts, shaped the movement to speak and to see the women's presence. They issued from you as the sun does from the horizon between the earth and the heavens. Yes, if you ask your peers who are these women young with backbones as hard as steel but pliable as worms, all of you will agree. One by one by one, the years piled up, past a time that is as still as these mountains of Mbizana, where the breeze embraces the stoic hills under the white clouds and the overbearing blue skies, where the rolling landscapes forever tempt the eye to walk them. Here, where songs of peasants were sung, have been sung and are being sung here and now, as they intertwine the mathematics of the bow and the arrow and stick wielding skills and fighting spear in hand. They are intertwined into a myriad of myths of gods and the human race and meaning of life lived simply. That is why we are still here. We listen to the po praise poets. Ah, who are under the watchful eye of the clouds and skies as peasants dwell here. So the koi and sun sought refuge in days gone by, in the veins, in the being, in the blood of all 
who would come to live here. The Koi and the Sun did seek sanctuary. They sought it in the blood of those who came here. Rich as that may be, they too are entwined in a myriad of myths which will never die. We had as the rocks of the hills which have been witness to it all, the bloody wars here then, the creation of the spirit utterly convinced that life must be lived, that lives in us. Look at the dwellings which seem as if to tip over. They are here, they stand against the greatest odds, they are spirals of time shaped through a quiet singing creation of peasant hands, singing the lives that they contain. These lives of those they who lived here knew that life begs nothing. It is not a favor to live it. And so they shaped knowledge and life and living and songs and beliefs. They live in time and time lived in them. Here dreams have been shaped into communities. Hymns have been and are sung here. We are all of us, the koi and the sun spread across, across this land in the same way that backbreaking work demands and is done. The songs are sung here, are woven as the idioms and proverbs weighted in experience and life are sung here and said for all to hear. They will be sung here in Isitosa, Sisotu, and English and Africans because bloody wars were fought here. Also here, remember the languages of the Koi and Sun and Isitosa, Sisotu, Africans and the English look locked horns here fiercely fighting for space in the mind of the nation, which molded the national question of the people and the land. Ah, O oh, R, how dare the land be left so loveless and lifeless and fellow in Mbizana? What does that mean? The peasants once act a living and lived blossomed lives from their bare hands and innate will, from simple tools purporting to be machines, and we were not afraid to share the land with others here. We gave out the land that long time ago, and knowing that by so doing, we build the future stated here for a school to be built, declared there for a church to be constructed, said there, build yourself a home. But that did not mean and must not mean and will not mean a home for these and not for those or the others. And so you said, O oh, R. We must accept and agree eventually that time, which was as real as the blue sky, like the blue sky, it is not real. I understood we did what we had to do, you said. Though we did negotiate with life and fate, we know that human beings do lie down one day and fall asleep forever to find our our souls or spirits, I find my soul here. My spirit is there and everywhere where I have been. Where we were seeking to know how the free human spirit resides on earth, seeking as it should to be part of the freedom phalanx. Millions and millions of masses of footsteps in movement within the movement 
you you'll find me there everywhere you said where i was sent i was nurtured here and there in the mood in the movement footsteps upon footsteps upon footsteps masses of footsteps of the people are as i said a phalanx a rhythm forever to keep you like the calm and still see o r you kept the pace and you moved we are the spirit of history today we are witnesses of our being activists we are cast in truths which we cannot and must not and never deny or defy because we have seen it all and heard it all when we falter when we fall when we keep the faith as a child clings to its mother and knows when to cry and how to suckle you will see you will know who we are and about the life we have lived we told everyone and anyone who dared to listen or or and to hear about our love of this nation stemmed in our being you are witnesses and have been witnesses forever to be the evidence of truth we are a, we are we are as present as time is always we know hope we shaped it with our own hands and lives that you taught us o o r you taught by the blood of the nation the masses the hard working people remember you said o r you come from behind the ngele mountain adorned with the elements at all times and sometimes the breeze whispers past it in peace as also the violent thunder bangs splashes lights in all its fire colors across the mountain the ngele the ngele mountain it is said you wandered there beyond it you had seen the thunder embrace it and you were witness to it as a child when it roared and cracked like a whip on its back you have seen and you see now the face of this the nation o r as you see the colors mauve yellow green red purple symbols of lives of life across the land you know the diversity of our being i am like this because of my people you said the people this nation i wonder in long moments too too short as i i become older what else should i have done here what else should i have taken from here as provision and forever these things which i have done and do and say have seen and know so insatiable they are whose spirit does not know or want or need freedom they ask me for us the nation it has had to be supreme our blood has been spilled for this and so my spirit took the songs of my people and the hymns and a myriad of beliefs which they these my people inscribed in my being to be umuntu umuntu ngabantu and i walked off then lenet as i was at times we head at the precipice as we hear the shattering of those who fall as their bones crush with their weight and their flesh the evil ones hoped for their end of life to shatter ours our hopes as they hit the fathomless bottom ah remember timor and we 
we know to begin from the beginning again after all this, after this head, a fathomless head, after this deep, deep head. O R, we have learned for many of you and the movement to begin from the beginning again. This is a strength of our spirit and heart. Ah, Timor, and you look smart in gold. Cabral, your peer, he dies in a footpath. His last footsteps stopped abruptly, caught in a snare, sinisterly made abroad, but held by one of his own. Ah, O R. And Cabral drops there out of the hand of his wife. Blood leaks from him. A bullet has pierced him. And his blood seeps into the soil of Guinea-Bissau as he dies. Ah, O R. What died then? Was it Africa? And we remember Bram Fischer your comrade and peer in a cell of doors of steel, which shut as if forever. They shut and shut because keys which turn many times before they finally lock are shutting them. They shut this door as if forever. Until we come to know that these deeds walk on very short legs and that we are defending non-racialism, which must stand on strong ones. We walk past the echoes, past the darkness, past the pain, past the horror. There lie the truths unseen. I'm sorry. There lie the truths unseen and heard about us and those who went, who whisper, saying that history cannot be turned back. History, like nature we live in and with OOR, it is forever patient for us to learn from. We wish the young who only know freedom can know that there have been thoughts which hit the ground with flesh and bone. Human life shattered on tar or succumbing to brutal impunity and death. There have been smudges of human blood on rocks, on trees, on ravines, on the earth they walk upon that men and women, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters of this land and nation, brothers and sisters betrayed. They gave their last, last sigh in the hands of madmen, men whose hearts, minds were filled with green or red, or, oh, what color is hatred? or fear, what is your color? We, we march on. Knowing that many before us have walked this pain and this path. Many and after him, Luxmat and Golda, and before them, Bambata, even the young bright boy, Biko, much later with a torn apart brain, damaged in a cell, he walked past with his youth. We walk with him now, even that little Hector boy, Hector Peterson, past here. We move with his silent footsteps. We moved in the movement which moved us with ideas, rumbling like millions of feet to the mountain which shifted with donkey and cow hooves and our footsteps to a destiny we shape with our strength. 
Remember the Freedom Charter, how we gave birth to it, born of defiance and, and concessions for a nation to emerge. It is these contradictions which made you Sisulu, Lambeta, Madiba, Hesha, Kuma, Lutuli, and us understand and say, what is life without ideas, knowledge, and thought, which breaks down doors and bars and prisons and prison cells of foolishness and ignorance. When we believe that in the universe there is reason and reasoning, that nothing for as long as we live just happens of its own and for its sake. There is, pay, there is a plan and we need to understand the plan. It's because you, O.R., held our hand when we're in search, driven by bitter anger and sorrow. Your warm hand, your passionate eye, your accommodating ear, your straight back when words lack, we heard you as you called our name. We will not hear what you said, what you and, and Fisher talk about. We are of flesh and so frail. But your large lives whisper to us still. Oh, you old patriots. Because you knew and understood that it is laws which form reality. But when we shape the law as persons, it is life we are shaping, which in turn forms us. What you and Dadu talk about and arrive at, we will not hear. Or when you ask Shaka Mushweshwe in the languages of this nation, with your husky voice and guttural laughter, how are you when you ask them? We wonder what they who stole the plains with such youthful speed and fury and grace, the young men and women who pierced the ribcage of contradictions trying to build a nation quickly, very quickly, very, very quickly. What had they seen or heard or touched or anticipated to do that? What will they say and how will they say these young men and women do they who with a spear shorter than the arm reach the rib cages and hearts of men, does Mam Porsche still need her blue black beauty spot on her cheek with a duke that leaves the top of her scalp showing dots of hair like a Masutu woman would do, the domestic worker she was. Dots of hair sprinkled on the scalp the aged fighter, female, who went to the world like migrating birds tirelessly fulfill the cycles of the seasons to say in a clear voice, it is normal to want to live and live freely with quality. Even the little ants know that the weather, even the little ants know that the weather changes that is why they, they gather food so eagerly. R O R, you know this as we know it. Listen to the organized little footsteps, marching and marching in a rhythm. Marching, they disappear, they come back when the heat of the sun speaks to its presence. These little things, as they build their cities underneath the earth, one with a natural knowing, who are you and others disappeared for 30 years. You came back. Do you remember how some of you just disappeared, leaving us with memories which know no peace? I smile as I try to imitate your dignity as we try to fit it on us like a jacket 
as I rehearse your wisdom in my head, it's heavy to wear, weights heavily, weights one heavily down, and it is full of the insults and the abuse of the oppressors. But the wearer is not afraid or threatened by this. It threatens our eyes used to, so, to say so. There is no need to be afraid, but to know, to understand and to learn and keep learning and to do so and to, and to accept all that is the beginning of a fight. OR, you will walk as should Madiba, as did the many, many women who, who marched to Pretoria, Dora Tamana among them. You will walk as did Sisulu and Khesha and Lambede, as did Rahima, as we often wonder about those who fell, they walked. The young, so many of them who flocked visible like migrating uh, flamingos. Ah, the flamingos migrating from poverty and the cruelty of oppression. The young took the bullet in the streets and alleys, in the footpaths and everywhere where people must not die. In game reserves and in villages, in towns and in houses which had become battlefields where their lives were abruptly, abruptly torn apart. How did all this sit in your, in your heart, O R? Did it happen? Did you ask why me, O R? Did you ask that question? Did you utter those words? When the time comes, O R, we will hear what you and Fisher talk about, what you and Dadu discuss, and what you and Uncle Reg with his rare humor and quietness, and Ray and Jack Simon, we will hear what you talk about. And when Madiba asks Shaka, with his husky voice and guttural laughter, how are you? All of you will break into laughter. Your happy laughter, we know it so much. Celebrating comradeship, which civilization has, has prized with human blood, which you all cherished, you will be amused by what you all have left here, behind, here. You left us, who flail in space and time, flesh and blood, brain and spirit, still struggling to make sense of it all. Of this different time now, who are the twilight or the dawn now all whisper and we whisper to you then there is a rapture coming there is a revolution coming and we miss you so much we miss you O R, O oh, beloved O R, O R. we try to imagine you living in this time as it promises to be dawn once more, will you be in communion with hundreds and millions and billions of freedom fighters and give us that spirit? Generations upon generations of the S freedom fighters. We hope you will then remember we are here, OR, to search with you, to search the only thing we have, our lives, for peace, in this time, when the, it is, has been announced, there is a fourth industrial revolution. R O R. Life threatening for us if we are not careful. But remember, do ancestors have memory? May I ask? You will then remember that we mean it when we say, when we remember you and think about you when you ponder over freedom, peace, security, and our lives. O.R. Do sleep well. Thank you.
Thank you, Tate, for um, an incredibly thorough uh, insight into the text of the poem and for the ground setting that you offered at the beginning. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to invite Luli Kalinikos to respond with her reading of the poem. Um, and and we, each of the speakers will offer comments uh, on the poem, their reading, their response of the poem, and then we'll, um, we'll ask you to respond and to address some of the, the, the comments and points that our, our speakers will make. Luli, may I call on you? Thank you, thank you everyone. I just want to comment that the light, uh, there's a power outage, the lights have just gone. Uh, but mm -hmm. it seems that on my laptop, uh, you can't hear me. Oh. We can hear you. Can you uh, speak louder? Can you just speak a little louder for the volume of yes. your voice? Yes, all right. Um, apologies. I was just saying that uh, we just, uh, there's a power outage, but uh, on my laptop, it seems to be okay. Uh, it's a bit dark. I've got my notes here. <laughs> um, and um, Brawali, what a, you know, what a moving uh, poem. And of course, you know, having spent almost 10 years of my life writing that biography. I took so long. Adelaide was, um, you know, becoming very upset about, <laughs> with me. But um, I, I just felt that there was just so much. And I interviewed nearly 200 people mm -hmm. about OR. Um, and um, this is just such a, a, a beautiful and moving um, tribute with all the elements um, that confronted OR. Um, and what I wanted to look at, though, what interested me was the fact that, uh, that, that actually OR had um, the traditional deeply embedded inside him. And one tends to forget that because, of course, uh, he became a worldwide figure. You know, he traversed the world, coming back basically just in time to die in his home again. And I was very fortunate to go with him to Nkantolo um, and to experience that uh, emotion and... and um, uh, the, the, the love of the reunion with two of his surviving sisters. Um, so uh, he, these, these traditional foundations remain very strong throughout his adventurous and uh, in, intense um, uh, interaction, you know, with the world and managing, of course, to awaken the world to, to the suffering and the evil of apartheid as well. Um, and, but it, it strikes me that I wanted to, just wanted to, as I said, emphasize the, the traditional within his, his uh, uh, you know, some examples of um, how Wally Serote's dazzling and moving tribute to OR and the ANC actually draw on traditionalism, even in exile. Um, for example, as a herd boy since our early childhood, um, he had a, an intrinsic love of animals in his care and an interest in, in, in nature. Um, all of that, of course, he hardly saw in exile. 
And uh, there are examples of how he just longed, achingly longed to, to be back home. Um, the physical nature of his childhood also um, had, uh, for example, traditional um, uh, uh, matches and stick fighting. Um, and these were, you know, he took great pride uh, and uh, boasted in his memoirs that uh, he never lost one except for one where they abruptly um, realized that they were going to hurt each other. So they stopped halfway. So, you know, these were um, skills that he uh, was able to, to kind of make a metaphor out of sometimes in the speeches that he made. Um, the, of course, the other aspect is the integral nature of a polygamous family, which was so inclusive, uh, you know, having three mothers who loved him. He could run into any, anybody's house, you know, and, and be given something to eat. Um, and that, that, that broad sense of belonging, which made it easy for him once he joined the ANC and then of course became the leader, uh, to be inclusive, um, every, everyone uh, was included, um, including his older brothers who weren't Christians. Uh, his father had four wives, the second died in childbirth, and he had uh, uh, quite a few brothers. And um, the fourth wife, his mother was the third wife, the fourth wife had three daughters. And he, he talks about this rich childhood. Um, the older brothers were not Christian and um, they were traditional and they were the ones who were uh, formed these, um, what he called columns and walked around uh, in, in their traditional dress and uh, picked fights and told stories and sang traditional songs. Um, and two of them uh, died uh, because they became migrant workers in order to raise money for Lobolo. Uh, two of them died in a, 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 um, a coal mine disaster. Um, but the one survivor, Bra Wilson, was the one who uh, um, paid for Oliver Tambo's education at the Holy Cross Mission Station. And so the older brothers enabled the younger brothers to get an education, which didn't mean that they became westernized, but that they they combined, you know, both the traditional and uh, Western education. And I just want to mention also, I don't think it's sort of really been properly absorbed even, uh, you know, in my biography, that OR, of course, was, uh, it, you know, got top marks, was very clever, uh, chose a, a Bachelor of Science rather than a Bachelor of Arts. You know, he was a serious scholar, uh, top in mathematics. Um, his dream, and he applied, you know, tried to apply for this, was to become a medical doctor who knew as much about traditional healing as Western medicine. And that was what he wanted to do. He wanted to pioneer and bring together all the forms of healing uh, that were available. Uh, unfortunately, Witts University at that time, we're talking about the, the late 30s, um, uh, refused to accept him because they said that it would be unseemly for a black medical student to uh, participate in um, uh, 
um, sorry, I've forgotten, you know, when uh, uh, autopsies, sorry, mm -hmm. participate in autopsies of white women. Uh, a, a quite a, a kind of pretty sickening <laughs> sort of, uh, you know, idea that this, that, that this would matter at all, both race and gender and, and so on. However, um, he was not able to take up that dream of his, of becoming a healer in every sense of the word. So instead he applied to Fort Hare um, and the Bunga, because of his um, uh, superb matric results, the Bunga uh, gave him a scholarship to study a uh, Bachelor of Science at Fort Hare. So um, that's what I just wanted to, you know, to, to, to sort of insert here. I know there isn't much time, so I suppose I, I'd better stop uh, at that point. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could just make one more, more point, you know, about uh, how the traditional and essential values of, of Ubuntu, um, you know, were, were ultimately woven into the Freedom Charter and, um, you know, inclusive, its inclusiveness, um, collective humanist um, and and, and uh, the inclusiveness of, of, of all nationalisms, all races and all genders. Thanks, Jim. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Lily, for giving us some food for thought. I mean, the interesting observations kind of like the fact that you, you sort of give us um, a history that some of us um, have no clue <laughs> in, t in terms of uh, all our um, life and, and struggles. Um, uh, I think this is very important uh, for all of us. I, I would want to hand over to Siraj um, to share his thoughts um, and in response to uh, uh, Browali's, uh, you know, reading of, of the poem. And, and uh, immediately thereafter, Budmantla will come in and, and, and do his thing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Munwa BC, and thank you so much to Brawali, to Luli. Uh, I had the tremendous honor uh, 15 years ago, probably, to spend time with Luli. Um, over, you know, many, over about a decade uh, on different councils and different committees, uh, including SARA, National Heritage Council, but also Freedom Park. And to be in conversation with Brawali and his colleagues there about the installation and the creation of institutions of national heritage. And along the way, it was so enlightening and educational to talk with Luli about uh, the world that made Mandela and also her book on Oliver Tambo. Um, because I was also writing a biography and, and we had the fundamental dilemma is how do you pay homage to a leader in a way that pays respect, but in a way that does not take him out, out of his movement and does not remove him from society. And those were the kinds of questions that our colleagues faced at Freedom Park as the tremendous pressure was brought to bear to turn Freedom Park into a kind of hero's acre 
along the lines of Zimbabwe and Namibia, but where Brawali and his colleagues resisted that and the care with which they embarked upon new methodologies embracing indigenous knowledge systems to create the Isi Vivani, the garden of remembrance with soil and rocks and plants and from every place where South Africans fell to create a place of mourning, not of hero worshiping. Because the question that is raised for us tonight, and it's the question that Luli asked and that was asked implicitly at Freedom Park, is how do we put Oliver Tambo in national memory? And I, I you know, reading Brawali's beautiful epic poem, I was reminded of what Luli used to tell me over and over about OR's humility, about him refusing to be called president. He would say, I'm only the acting president. I am president because others are in prison. He was a, a proxy president that he listened to all sides. He was a conciliator of opposing views that he personified collective leadership. Those were what I learned about Oliver Tambo. And these were ideas that went against the grain of what was being installed in South Africa, which I described elsewhere as a memorial complex marked by a biographic order, where in many places, biography of leaders was taken to be not just lessons of struggle, but lessons with, for which we had to be obedient that accompanied a, a, a framework of citizenship that was about obedience. This work is not that. This is a vivid, poignant, lyrical, gentle, yet complex work that draws our attention to the sonic and the sonorous, to song, songs of freedom, but songs of joy, to sounds, to sounds of violence, of the thuds of bodies and the thuds of history. This is a work of love of intimacy and respect. This is not the biographical as obedience. It is for O.R. who loved his people with what Wally calls granite hard love, unbreakable love. It is about movement. It is about a movement of values, about people in motion, departing, returning, moving comradely together, the living and their dead. It places OR alongside other activists and comrades. Among the people on the land, and where they live, and in relation to their wisdom. O.R. is placed into his childhood landscape amidst the people, including the Khoi and the San, whose being runs through the blood of everyone. They never died. They shape knowledge, he says, and life and living and songs and beliefs. This is about the relationship between song 
and labor, between war and song. It places OR in the history of violence and massacre from Pondo land in 1960 to Maseru, to Matola, Khabaroni. It places him in the people's blood that was spilt and in the blood of people's hearts. It is OR placed in music and justice. It is about where OR's spirit resides, free. Everywhere where I have been, as Seroti says for OR. It resides within the movement, everywhere where I was sent. He was teacher who taught by the blood of the nation. He is placed among his comrades, not like a pantheon, but like a web or branches of a tree. And yet this is a story, as I've said, that is filled with motion and movement. About teaching, fearlessness, and of the necessary fears amid conditions of secrecy and the dangers of underground work, of the vigilance needed in the face of the possibility of state security and dangerous stealthy enemies, even amongst us, even amongst the people, pretending, as he says, like serpents, like a disease. This is about freedom as a labor of building networks, pathways, and highways. And it's about building these among those who have fallen, who've had their bones shattered, once again, the sound of history. It places OR amongst his anti-colonial fighting comrades, among his South African comrades and fighters like Fisher, amidst the blood spilt by fallen comrades, crushed and killed, in brutal ways, amongst those who sang and danced and healed and who took the fallen into their bloodstream. We moved in the movement which moved us with ideas. O.R. is the holder of hands with his warm hand. He is compassionate. He, is a, he has an accommodating ear. He has a straight back with his finger on the pulse of the nation. He has a happy face. He listens. He hugs. O.R. is placed alongside the women in the struggle of Mam Tenge, of Kate, of Ruth. We hear O.R. speaking gently to his comrades. O.R. is always talking and discussing with his comrades in amplified soft voice. It puts him with the travails and the sufferings of his comrades, their cancer, their strokes, their loneliness, and with those who have died and departed from comradeship. And it puts him in the anti-apartheid networks. He is seen in relation to his own sensuousness and sensitivities and sensibilities. He is in motion. He is walking. This is about dignity and bravery in death of those who were executed and those who died in the struggle. He is alongside Madiba. But importantly, he is also movingly placed with Pilan Dwandwe, with the dead whose names live here in our life. He is placed in relation to the fighters whose graves are scattered in Southern Africa. This is no lifeless monolithic monument 
of stone or steel. This is a labor of love, a work to live with, to read aloud over and over for us to teach each other with. Thank you so much, Brawali. Thank you, Siraj. Um, we, we are listening attentively and I'm sure we can hear. Thank you for, for those interesting reflections. Um, Budmandla, um, I'm sure you're ready as ever. <laughs> thank, thank you, uh, Chair. First off, I'd like to thank uh, the Center for Humanities research uh, of, of the University of Western Cape, and also Quella Books for hosting this wonderful conversation with Dr. Mongane Walisi Rote, to which, and also thank everyone for inviting us to this. I think it's a very powerful meeting and I'm very happy uh, in talking about this work because it falls in the tradition uh, of poetry, which the scholars call imbongi or praise poetry. Mm. And then I'm reminded of a comment made by James Baldwin. Actually, Brawali introduced me a lot to reading James Baldwin when we were in exile in Botswana. Baldwin, in an, in an essay called The Artist's Struggle for Integrity, says, quote, I want to suggest two propositions. The first one is that poets, by which I mean all artists, are finally the only people who know the truth about us. Soldiers don't. Statesmen don't, priests don't, union leaders don't, only poets. That's my first proposition. We know about the Oedipus complex, not because of Freud, but because of a poet who lived in Greece thousands of years ago. The one thing I would like to say about poets is that wrapped up in the consciousness of a poet are various incarnations. There's a poet, a storyteller, chronicler, griot, seer, or prophet. And in saying all this, I come to the poem uh, of Prawali, Sikakilo R which I think is a poem that all of us, the South African public and the world out there should be profusely thankful for. I'm also split in my mind into three consciousnesses or considerations in discussion, in discussing this. Uh, on the one hand, I know the poet, Rawali, whom I first met in 1973, in Cape Town, when the Black Consciousness Movement, BCM, was launching the South African Black Theatre Union, SAP2. And uh, we've had a friendship spanning a number of lifetimes. His creativity has deep roots in the South African experience, nurtured perhaps in the bloody reality of our bloody country. These were friends like Tami Miele, with whom Brawali was in Mithoti Black Theater, were slain as part of the massacres that Brawali writes about, where O.R. quote, presided and we resided, unquote. It's a grounding where artists memorize voluminous tracts like Aim Cizer's uh, epic poem, Return to My Native Land. The cadences, the musicality, the almost liturgical, syncopated rhythms of the lyric, for that's what it is. 
is reminiscent of the call and response sequences found in gospel sessions. For Rawali is in a dialogue with his ever believer regional Kaizana Tambo. This is the uncrowned prince of the world, a man that South Africa has had the misfortune of never having as its president. The second level of consciousness in reaction to the epic poem is of course lodged in the pain of reading a truth. I have lived of, of, of reading a truth I believe reflected back to me. While his poem is a long history lesson, tracing the time before O.R. Tambo's ascendancy to power, where he was growing up in Pizana, the people he met, the influences of those that went before him, Lutuli, Kruma, the latter work in the liberation movement with its triumphs and tears, and gains and losses. These, are, these are lines etched indelibly on, on my mind, how the political education that OR imparted, nurtured, quote, young women with backbones, hard as steel, but pliable as worms, unquote. These are people who brave times endless patience. Here we learn of the pioneering work in the years when being politically motivated could be a signing of one's death warrant, where people like Ahmed Timol and Luxmat Ngulde were among the first ones to die in detention. It doesn't end there. There were those in the other liberation movements, like Amilcar Cabral of the PAIGC, who was ass assassinated in Guinea Conakry. The poet invokes all these names and many others in the pantheon of heroes and heroines. The work of an Imbong is to praise. It is also to castigate the powers that be, using the immunity of the court to tell all and sundry if the emperor has no clothes. In showing us in emotive language the kind of exemplary leader O.R. Tambo was, Mongane Serote gives us a glimpse into the, into the kind of leadership we certainly do not have. In the silence between word and thought, we can even imagine the leadership we did not deserve. We are therefore fo forced to grapple with lost opportunities where Tambo's painstaking attention to detail aimed at crafting a new world is being eroded every day, mainly by a man who invoke his name and the name of his political movement. For instance, O.R. was the commander in chief of Umkondo Wesizwe or MK, an army set up to combat the depredations of centuries advance and protect the interests of the suffering majority of this country. It must be galling to see the blasphemy against everything or are held sacred and dear. Brawali, as, as we know him, alerts us to those men and women who are part and parcel of the liberation struggle but who do everything like termites to bring the house of liberation down. But if he writes about them, while he also knows about their, that their strivings will be defeated by the will of the people. Here are lines of his poem. He says, we engineer change by being constant like that change, by nurturing knowledge. The third facet of my reading is the utter joy and surprise at the poet's preoccupation with truth. While he shies away from his autobiographical writing, this of course doesn't mean that 
his own past, a past whose painful experiences he can sublimate into a series of renditions of the pain of others doesn't catch up with him. As someone who in 1969 suffered hideously as a detainee in the hands of the security branch, he knows, he empathizes with anyone who has had the misfortune of experiencing captivity. He understands the visceral helplessness of being in the hands of torturers. In this, he is no different from his poetic counterpart, Mahmoud Darwish, the late Palestinian poet whose collection, A State of Siege, is introduced by Munir Abash. Of Darwish, and in my book, Sirote, Munir Abash writes, quote, in his struggle to reach the truth of his being, he transformed overwhelming pain into brilliant creation. His impulse to, to tame pain, to transcend wounds, and to reconcile hope with a life terrorized by cruelty makes our very being shine. Pain was his pen as words were his wounds." Unquote. In writing about the pain of others, Serote is at his most lyrical. Some of this pain is over the poet's own bewilderment at the kind of card dealt to people, comrades he once knew, even those who faded into ignominy. Jackie Silibe's descent from the stellar heights of leadership to die in disgrace as a convicted felon might have fueled Schadenfreude among his detractors. It, however, gave Sirot a pause, leading him into an exploration of the complexity of human existence. The trope of rising and falling of the vicissitudes of life is a well-known signature in his poems. Here he intercedes on the fallen Silivers' behalf in a heartfelt sequence. Quote, Please receive Jackie Silive, as he staggers to you, he's your son. O O R, I say, need I say so? Jackie should not have left from here to there so soon. Please receive him. Look him in the eye and welcome him. He needs to rest as he needs forgiveness. For inside him, there is a song as deep as his humor as deep as his love for this land, the people, and what makes this a nation." Unquote. Pilandwandwe, a chilling story. Pilandwandwe was tortured and held naked for 10 days before the security police gave up on recruiting her as an Ascari and shot her in the head. When she was exhumed, her nakedness had been shielded with a blue plastic carrier bag over her loins. This part of the poem is as difficult to read as it must have been to write. It encapsulates the meaning of O.R. Tambo leaving Gantolo Pisano, a strapping youth to return walking with the aid of a stick after a stroke. It represents the long walk that people have had to take, the mountains climbed, the rivers crossed to reach a certain destination. This freedom, Wallis Sirote always says, was not free. The epic poem gives us the weight of it all, the price that had to be paid. It tells us there's a long way before we get home. Pilani, Pila, she lets us know now once more to say Pila's name lives here in our life. Everything is here, present in us. Whether her eyes were closed or not, we forget not. 
as she thought of the child she was leaving behind. We look away, we fight our tears, we wipe them and repeat. You whispered into our ear when the bullet shattered the base of your head, Pila. If we cry, let us. Let it be to agree that here we go again. Ah, Commandir, we salute you from where the simple word resides in us. Freedom, free, child of OR. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Budmantle. Um, I mean, your, your analysis is great, very beautiful in relation to what we are all about. Um, just before I hand over to Heidi, I just want to pick up on the chats uh, just to keep our audience involved in, in the reflection and conversation. Uh, Brawali, I think you, you're receiving um, very nice praises from your audience about the work uh, that you've pulled together. People are thanking you and um, also congratulate you for, for this achievement. I also pick up um, a comment written in Iskosa, which I'm keen to read. O R Hingangalala and Nomzilla Omle Onganakuze Tinuem to Alala O R Alala. I could offer a free English translation for the benefit of our audience. Um, o R is a powerful figure uh, with an indel indelible impression. Um, congratulations, O R, congratulations. There is a very nice question here, which I would like to direct to um, one of our panelists, uh, Luli in particular. Um, someone is asking, I would like to ask what makes the poem an epic poem? I'm sure for Luli, uh, that's walk in the park. Um, Do you want to take on that? Thank you. Um, uh, a walk in the park, are you perhaps referring to my, <laughs> my Greek heritage? <laughs> because, of course, that's where epic poems uh, perhaps not began, but they were certainly developed. And, of course, they're epic in the sense not only that they travel over time, um, but they send us a message which is both universal and long -lived. Can I help? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Please come in. Yes. I think the, the traditional definition of an epic poem mm -hmm. is, a, is a lengthy narrative work of poetry which uh, deals with the lives and struggles and strivings of people and uh, which where things happened during an extraordinary period and then the people who are celebrated in that epic poem did extraordinary things way and beyond what could have been let's say done by uh, normal men or women. You can go back to to your uh, mythology in Greece or any other part of the globe where there are those. In fact, a lot of history was originally written in forms of epic accounts, epic uh, poetry. So I would say in defense of this, why you would call this an epic poem, the one that Wally has written, is because uh, what O.R. Uh, himself 
achieved or what he caused others to achieve because he was also an agent that drove quite a lot of other circumstances. There was a time, for instance, when uh, Fidel Castro went to visit, uh, was talking to OR about the fact that OR has held a liberation movement intact for over, I think it was around 20 something years then, including men and women under arms was a feat that no ordinary person could achieve. So this is a very long and convoluted answer, but this is just my stabbing at it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Siraj, would, would you want to throw a word or two? Are you, are you comfortable? No, I'm, I'm comfortable, but obviously in literary studies, I mean, the idea of epic as a technical uh, application. And, you know, I was, as a former lawyer, you know, I once spent a long time studying the Aeneid by Virgil. And as a scholar of African history, later was introduced to the Sunjata epic, which is the, the narrative that is told in many communities in different societies in West Africa. And so, so, but, but I think in this sense, uh, you know, I, I think the way in which Luli and Mandla have described the epic applies here. You know, not in, for me, not in a, I'm, I'm not interested, I'm, you know, I'm not concerned with the, the technical application. I'm concerned with the majesty of the work, its breadth in time, its depth, you know, it's, it's in space. It's, it's, and just, it's, I think it's significance for us at this moment uh, makes that an apt, um, apt uh, description. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Raj. Heidi, your audience. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, uh, Monwa Bisi, I wanted to invite uh, Ntate Serote to respond to Luli, Luli's engagement with his, with the poem um, through this kind of really deepening of these intimate peaks into the life of a person who is paid homage in the poem, but in the way that I think uh, Brahmandla has very carefully and patiently laid out for us. Um, most, you, I mean, this panels, I, I, I need to admit, I, I feel very emotional and very moved. Um, I think it's partly the poem itself, its force, uh, the work it does as a poem, um, it both kind of bruises beneath, from beneath the skin, like a peach uh, that's overripe. Um, it bruises from the inside. And I think that attests to its great, it, the, 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 the great, um, the technical brilliance of its writing, but also the more than that. Uh, and it, in that sense, it's also an homage to the, the work of Ntate Serote. Um, but Luli brought, you know, a, 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 an additional kind of glimpse into um, particularly that very beautiful anecdote of O.R., uh, of, of his dream to be a healer in the fullest sense of the word, both adequate to the best of what uh, Western medicine may have given us, but also to the best of what traditional medicine has given us. Um, to Siraj's point, which I think was particularly powerful about the work of freedom being a labor, being an effort, being a work, and that, you know, that um, 
perhaps to, to come into that uh, in response to that. I think it's a very important challenge to think of in relation to this poem being written at this moment um, when, as I think Zubaydah Jaffa said uh, a little earlier, that uh, we cannot consider the possibility of this dream being forsaken or for there to be a limited understanding of the next generation. Um, and then to the incredibly expansive kind of world embracing insight and reading that uh, Mandla Langa gave us, which was, I think, to, to place the poet um, in a very particular kind of role, both in relation to um, the, the anecdote you shared about reading Baldwin's essay on the integrity of the artist, um, or at least the artist's struggle for integrity, um, and the, the task that uh, this poem, in a way, um, meets as, as a text that is struggling with a question of integrity in political leadership, in, um, in terms of ideas and uh, imaginations for this time that has a concept of a broader good, a common good, uh, one that's not divisive, one that is ambitious, but that is also conciliatory without foregoing the, the work that is, uh, you know, that the poem kind of calls us and recalls us back to in OR's vision, that the work or labor for freedom is also a labor for peace with justice. Um, and, and these are incredibly big and rich ideas, but incredibly, uh, important for our current moment. I think both in South Africa, but also across the world, what, what we see um, and what we live through and experience here, I think is, um, resonates with many other places in the world at the current time. So with, you know, just picking up those three small um, nuggets from each of the speakers' readings, uh, a very beautiful and moving readings of your poem, Ntate uh, Serote, if you would like to make a response um, or a comment back to them and to us. Well, Heidi, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, one of the most important things that I take from the comments of the panelists is a, the emphasis about how OR was very, very, very much loved, because that is what really defines him. It's also in the preface, uh, President Becky gave it that touch about love. And I'm specifically emphasizing the question of love because I think as a people, as a nation, we need it very much. Uh, even before COVID-19, we already must have known instinctively that we really, really, really need love in this country. And I pick up on uh, uh, what Luli was saying. Um, it is now and then very difficult to associate being traditional with uh, being part of the movement. But then we have to find a way to redefine because that, that, that word traditional has been, I'm not saying the way Lulu was using it is incorrect. It's very appropriate and correct and relevant. 
but we know that it is also tainted by this country and we need to liberate it. And I think OR liberated it. Uh, uh, I want to share something with Luli and I hope she'll love, she'll laugh with love. One day I was, uh, we were at the headquarters of the African National Congress. And as I emerged in the passage, I saw OR and I thought to myself, I'm going to tease him today. Now, uh, I don't know where I got that courage, but I really quickly walked and kept caught up with him. And of course, I remarked about something that I'd been very, very curious about for a very, very long time, but had no courage to raise it with him. And I said, oh, Ar, the marks on your cheeks have made you very, very beautiful. Now, I don't know who talks like that to a president, but that day I did. And OR responded in a manner that I did not expect because he says, they are mine, they are mine. And he was very emphatic that these marks on him are mine. And Luli, that's, that's, that's the thing about OR, you see. He carried them with utter pride. They were there, visible. And of course, they were his. And they marked him from uh, uh, to say where he comes from. The people that he came from, because the people that he came from all had those marks, uh, which uh, defined them uh, as a people who they were. And I thought I should make that remark because he received my remark with utter pride, strength, and emphasis that they were his. Um, I also, uh, Suresh, right? Siraj. Hmm? Siraj. 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 I think you touched on an extremely very important thing which we as South Africans, for some reason, uh, have not have not thought through. There on the mountain in Pretoria, Salva Corp, the capital city of our country, stands this heritage site, built by many, many mines, many mines of South Africans, of people from the African diaspora, also from, of people from different parts of the world, but also speaking about people in other countries like the Cubans. But I am always uh, amazed by how as if very consciously and very deliberately the media in this country has not fathomed and tried to understand what is this thing. And I raise it like that because uh, Luli, uh, Luli will attest to this. When we were beginning to, to, to build it, two very serious things were raised, which then shaped as it, as it is now. We were asking, moving around the country and asking, if we were to create something that portrays your history, your being, your being South African, everything about you, what would you want to see on that mountain and describe the mountain to people and so on? Related to the fact that it was called uh, for, to be built by Madiba and that President Mbeki was fully behind it also thinking about it. He put it to the people. And two things happened, which we then had to find a way to say them uh, 
The first thing that people said was, do not forget that the soil of this country is soaked in human blood of people who fought against apartheid. Generally speaking, that's what the people were saying. The second thing which uh, people said was, um, remember that a lot of people who are alive are carrying unhealing wounds in them and they walk the, street, the streets of this country. So when you build it, you must remember that's what you are portraying and how must you portray it. Uh, and I think all of us who participated in its creation have all kinds of memories about emanating from what people said and how the people who came to it on a daily basis as it was being constructed, what comments they made, what they hoped it would do to them, what they hoped they would give to, to it. Because the other thing which is very important uh, and Luli again here was witness to that. A lot of people who came to participate in the creation of Freedom Park were indigenous knowledge systems practitioners. They were indigenous knowledge systems holders and they gave their everything to contribute to, to, to the building of that, of that, of that uh, heritage site. And I'm going on and on uh, like this too, because I'm wondering what is it that is missing, which, which must uh, encourage the nation to take ownership of that place? What is it? I say this against the backdrop that uh, I know that many times, if you go to Fredrickson Park, you are received by utter tranquility and silence. And that is also because there are no people there. What is it that we should have done to give this heritage site as a present to the people of this country. What is it? I ask myself all the time when I get there. Lastly, just to uh, talk to some of the issues that uh, Mandla raised. Mandla didn't tell us that he's a poet himself. Uh, he is a poet, Mandla. He and I have been comrades and friends for a very, very long time. And he has given us as a nation very, very valuable uh, uh, poems. And uh, as he was talking, I was also wondering as to whether we as South Africans, did we know, do we know that there is no way that we are ever going to part with poetry. And that is precisely because South Africa is a poetic country. Uh, all you need to do is be in one of the provinces. You will not have to look for what is poetic about that province. Poetry will begin to talk to you as soon as, soon as you enter. Uh, that, that province. Now we have nine of them and all of them day and night speak poetry. But also all of them at all times remind us with, its, with, with their poetry who we are. You know, when you talk about the rivers of this country, you talk about the sea of this country, 
We talk about the, the, the ravines of this country. We talk about the jungles of this country or the mountains. I never forget to wonder if all of these features of our land were to speak. One morning, if we woke up and we had no choice but to listen to them speak, what is it that they would tell us about us, about our country? Uh, so when Manda was uh, uh, speaking to the issue of poetry, this is what he conjured in my, in my mind. And lastly, I, I really want to be very thankful uh, to the panelists, to the hosts, uh, to the attendees. Uh, I leave this moment with many, many thoughts, which I received from yourselves. Uh, and pleased that we made time at this hour of our country to speak about OR. I say the hour of this country because all of us are hurt, deeply hurt, by how some people captured our country, our, our state, our movement, and completely abused it and, uh, at, with an attempt to destroy it. We must, as a nation, because the nation is the last vast defend, defense for our country, we must defend it and say it cannot happen while we are here and in our name. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ntate Serote. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Siraj Rasu, Luli Kalinikos, uh, Brahman Lalanga, for a really extraordinary opportunity to hear you read your poem in your own voice um, was powerful and, 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 and moving in ways that opened it up even further. Um, I want to thank Monwabisi Khalakhala, uh, the Dean of the faculty and co-moderator with me, uh, Narod Bramdor from Africa Sun, African Sun Publishing and particular thanks to UWC Press. Um, thanks also to Quela Books uh, who were uh, co-organizers in conjunction with UWC Press for this really remarkable opportunity that I think um, myself, uh, the panelists and all of the attendees uh, feel very grateful for being able to, uh, to participate in. Um, there are some two questions on the chat which, uh, which I'll email to, um, to uh, Nerod Brandor and um, hopefully the conversation can continue in another way. And I'd like to thank <clears throat> again, everybody for joining us uh, across the continent and across the world broadly, but also uh, our friends, our, 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 our colleagues and our comrades um, for whom the questions that are opened in this epic poem um, burn in our hearts um, and in our minds. So thank you for that. Thank you for this Ntati Serote and thank you everybody and have a good evening. Thank you. It was a wonderful. Uh, Long live the chair. <laughs> Long live the poets. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Monma Thank Thanks, Luli. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.